Hello, everyone, and welcome to A Day in the Life. I'm your host, Rachel Miles Shiatich, and today we have Seth, who I met through my brother, Hank, while we were all at Georgia Tech. Hank and Seth were in the same fraternity, and so we just see each other at various events and whatnot. Um, and at one point, Seth and I were both on the college's sci-fi radio show where we talk about all things sci-fi. And Seth works as an electrical engineer, but it's also gotten into politics. He's run for office. And as far as I know, you got like a write-in sort of, you're, you're holding some kind of office now. So um, we'll definitely talk about that. And he also recently got married. So lots of things. Uh, and welcome, Seth. Thank you. Yeah. So let's just start with um, kind of just like work and, and kind of in that area. So let's start with your role as an electrical engineer. What does that involve and how did you get into it? Yeah, so I am currently working in the RF field, which is radio frequency. Um, so for a lot of people right now, it means working on like 5G products. Um, which some people in my company do. Um, I work for analog devices as a test engineer. And so we have, we make parts like switches and transmitters and that sort of thing that work at like 5G frequencies. And so my job is to test the parts that we get and um, you know do sort of like batch yield analysis, that sort of thing. Cool. Uh, what made you interested in that field? Um, so I, I actually kind of fell into RF. I didn't specialize in RF in college. What I did was I studied signal processing, which is sort of closely related. Um, but it just happened to be that the first job I got out of college was working for a startup as an RF engineer. Um, so I didn't have really any specific experience or desire to get into RF, but it was the first job offer I got. And it's, you know, once once you get into a certain field as an engineer, you're sort of kind of pigeonholed there um, with your work. And luckily, you know, RF is a pretty big field with 5G um, becoming such a growing part of industry right now. Yeah. So I've been like kind of hearing on the side a little bit about like EMFs, like what's that like electromagnetic fields or something? Is that, I don't remember if that's like what that stands for, but is that something you test for or work with at all? Uh, so no, but only because, so um, right now, um, so like the parts I uh, am working on are, we sort of just test to make sure that they work, that they don't really emit any frequencies or anything like that. Um, so we don't have to like test for emissions or anything, um, at least not in my division, so. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, my husband's kind of into that and he has like one of those like EMF like meters and like sees like how much like different devices around our house like emit, emit those fields. So I was just kind of like, is that related? Cause I don't know much about it. I just kind of know that they're, they're there and emitting. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, at my previous job at the startup, um, I did a lot of work with antennas, so that was more of a concern was not just like what we were putting out into the, the air, which is heavily regulated by the FCC, but um, also sort of the interference that we get as well, because, you know, we're trying to measure like a certain signal and uh, whatever interference we're getting just adds to the noise for that. Gotcha, gotcha. And, and how did you like even pick electrical engineering in the first place as your major? Uh, so, I mean, I kind of, when I was a kid, like in elementary school, I wanted to be a genetic um, scientist. That was just something that I said, like when I was like eight years old, I was like, I'm gonna be a genetic scientist, um, which I, I think would have still been really interesting, you know, getting to work on like things like CRISPR and that sort of thing. But, um, you know, I was more just interested because of like Pokemon and like, I don't know, just like evolution and that sort of thing. Um, I, I don't know why I got so hooked on it. But then like, as I got older, um, I did sort of want to become an engineer just to learn how the world works um, a bit because, you know, I was really into video games and electronics in general and just, I didn't understand sort of the principles 
behind it and like why it worked. And I thought it was just really fascinating. And that's what drew me, drew me to it. Um, and I was just, you know, had a, I was really good at math when I was a kid. So I figured uh, it would be a good direction to go in. And I, I still think it was. Yeah, that's that's definitely good that you still think it's a good direction. <laughs> that's what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. So um, after you graduated from Georgia Tech, like, what is your? I mean, you kind of talked about this, but like, you you definitely moved to a different state and everything. So like, what has kind of like your career journey been like? Because you said you worked at a startup, and like, how has that been different? Um, like your different experiences. Yeah, so my current job, I've just been working here for about four months um, since April. And before then, I was working at Environetics, which was a small startup in Maine, um, which was a spinoff company from the University of Maine from some of the research they were doing on temperature sensors. And, you know, my main motivation was to move to Maine. I, I had always sort of liked Maine. Uh, we went there for vacation uh, when I graduated from high school. And I was like, you know, this would be a great place to live. So I did try to apply to jobs where I wanted to live. And it just happened to be that the first job offer I got was in Maine, up in Orno, near the University of Maine. And so, yeah, it was a small company, like we're talking really small, like three engineers uh, working on temperature sensors. And I did pretty much everything there. Um, whether it was, you know, doing the testing or the design of antennas or like our sensor packaging on like the materials level um, to also like going and like installing things in the field. Like we had some projects with power plants. So we'd actually go and like climb in the broilers and like uh, attach antennas to pipes and test them and that sort of thing. So I sort of had a, a large number of hats that I wore in that role. Um, and as a startup, you know, it's, I didn't see a lot of opportunity coming from that. And so I started to look for other jobs during the pandemic. Um, and I wanted to work for like a larger company and that's how I ended up at analog devices now, um, which is, you know, it's a big, like multinational corporation. So it's, it's going from pretty much like the smallest tech company you could possibly be in to, to one of the largest ones, um, which has been an interesting experience. Um, although it feels like some of that's been changed a little bit because of the pandemic. Um, I haven't met a lot of the people I work with because a lot of people are still working remotely and that sort of thing. Um, but that's kind of been my trajectory so far. So I went to Maine and then moved down here to the, the greater Boston area oh, in just the last four months. And you would say like right now your role is definitely more like, is it more, it's more specialized because before you were wearing mm -hmm. a lot of hats and that's kind of been my experience with large companies is kind of like you're, you have your like specialty and you pretty much stick to it. Yeah, they, you know, there's like one machine and I work on that machine and that's sort of supposed to be my, my specialty. So I work on that machine and test like these certain parts that come through. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's a little less uh, overwhelming. So what does testing involve? Like, do you use like instruments? I don't know, I'm like, I don't know anything about it. So maybe you just stop, like, what does that actually look like? Yeah, so I mean, it, it looks, a lot different for different parts. Like obviously if if you look at some of like the old like test tubes and like computers, they, they're like these big parts which are like a couple inches on each side. But now like we have like our silicone wafers, uh, silicone wafers which can have like thousands and thousands of devices on them. And so we have like a microscope and like a prober which has little um, like positive negative tips on the end of it so we can test the parts, which may only be like a couple millimeters wide and tall. Um, so yeah, there'll be like a prober which tests it. It'll be connected to like your typical electrical test equipment, like oscilloscopes or voltmeters or that sort of thing, power amplifiers. And what we're trying to do is just test the parts for um, their capabilities. So like, say we have a switch, 
which has like an input and two outputs and it has to operate from like I don't know two gigahertz to 70 gigahertz so we want to test across that frequency range make sure that you know when we tell it to switch to one output it's actually switching to that output and um that sort of thing and you know we're looking for certain modes of failure um and making sure that the parts are are passing and that a certain percentage of our wafer is passing so that we're not you know wasting a lot in our fabrication process got it yeah so it's kind of different depending on what you're looking at, which, which that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the other thing I was really curious about is um, your political career. How did that start? <laughs> uh, so, I mean, back in college, I did a bit of like volunteering for the Bernie Sanders campaign. He was the first politician that I ever really got involved with or worked on a campaign for um, or volunteered on a campaign for. And that was sort of, you know, before then I did pay attention to politics a little bit, like I was invested in like the Obama Romney uh, election and that sort of thing. But, um, you know, Bernie Sanders was one of those politicians that really spoke to me about, you know, the, the student debt that I was accruing, the, the medical debt that I was accruing in college as well. Um, and just really brought that perspective that was not present in America. American politics before, at least not that I had experienced. And so that was sort of what drew me in. And then when I moved to Maine, um, sort of being an adult living on my own for the first time, I realized that, you know, if you want to take the initiative, you can get involved in your community and whether that's through volunteering or running for political office. And so I did try to run for Bangor City Council up there a few times unsuccessfully. Um, but I did work on a number of other campaigns. I worked, volunteered on the Bernie campaign in 2020 again and tried to stay involved with like various, um, not really political organizations, but there was like a group called Food and Medicine up there, which um, focused on like building community gardens and lobbying politicians for, you know, like healthcare and that sort of thing. Um, Cause the whole concept was, you know, food and medicine, you shouldn't have to choose between one or the other. And um, so getting involved with like things with that and um, just trying to make my community a better place was what I wanted to do. And I did get involved in, you know, some of the actual like, uh, behind the scenes, like party work, like I uh, was a delegate in the Democratic Party for Bernie Sanders at the state level. Um, but then I also got like elected to the uh, Democratic State Committee up there, um, which is sort of just like the governing party body of the party, um, you know, coming up with the platform and all of that stuff for Maine. So I did that and served on the Rules Committee and that sort of thing. So I, I did I did a bunch of different other other things. Um, you know, between like volunteering on campaigns, volunteering for like organizations, and then also just like trying to get involved with the um, the political process itself. And, and then, yeah. Yeah. Um, so then moving down here, um, I live in this little town, Kingsboro which is outside of Lowell in Massachusetts, which is just another city outside of Boston. And this town is like 11,000, 12,000 people. So it's even smaller than Bangor where I was coming from, which was like 35,000. Um, so it's kind of rural, it's a small town and it's a little bit different in the sense that it doesn't have a city council. It's got like a select board and they have like town meetings every year to vote on things so like town policies and that sort of thing. Um, but I realized that there was a housing board seat open in the election this spring that nobody was running for. Um, and so there was just an open write in spot. And uh, my wife, Jess, actually met some people who were uh, helping the one of the select uh, board candidates run. 
And she mentioned that I was interested in, in writing myself in for housing board. Um, and so they spread the word and I actually ended up getting like over a hundred votes for, for my writing campaign without knowing anybody in town, wow. um, just from posting on a few Facebook groups and uh, talking to people. So, and I, I did that like just a few days before the election too. Like the, the Saturday before we found out that, um, you know, we could actually do this and then the Tuesday after was the election. Um, and I think there's a lot of things like that throughout the country where, you know, they're just looking for somebody to step up and fill the role. And there's a lot of that on the local level, which people won't pay attention to as much. Um, but like, for instance, we have like a cemetery commissioner position, which, you know, it's not like a glamorous thing or anything, but it's like something that you can do for your town and nobody ran for it. So it's still not filled or it wasn't filled last time I checked. Wow. Yeah, because I mean, it doesn't get the attention that the presidential election gets that like, but then the local politics really affects your area and where you live. And, and there's so much that goes behind the scenes that people just don't think about myself included. Yeah. yeah so for instance, like the housing board that I'm now on, their whole uh, job is to create more affordable housing in town and maintain the current affordable housing. So, you know, if a bunch of people get elected to that who don't care about affordable housing, who don't want it to happen, you know, they can just stonewall the entire process and, you know, no more affordable housing will get built in the town. Um, luckily, that's not the case here. Like, everybody seems interested in making sure that it's getting built and that sort of thing. But if people don't pay attention, that sort of thing can happen. It has happened in other towns throughout the country where people sort of hijack a board like that and try to, you know, drive it into the ground and that sort of thing. Um, so it, it can definitely be important because, you know, that can be like something like 20 families that aren't, aren't housed in the future, so. Yeah, did you see anything like that happen when you lived in Maine? Um, no, not necessarily. Um, something did happen in New Hampshire up here uh, along those lines where, um, you know, there was a town in New Hampshire and there was this big Tea Party movement of people who were like libertarians who wanted to move to New Hampshire and create like this um, libertarian paradise because the whole motto of New Hampshire is live free or die. And they essentially took over this town. They got elected to the town board and then like defunded um, all the town services, like animal control and uh, that sort of thing. And then eventually um, there was no waste management. All the people who were living in the town beforehand realized what was going on and were like, wow, this is terrible. There's just like trash littering the streets um, and it's like attracting bears. There was like bears run overrunning the town and that sort of thing. And that's a really extreme example of what can happen. Um, and no nothing like that. I really saw it happen on the local level in Bangor um, or in Maine or around there, but um, that's just one anecdote. Yeah, but I feel like sometimes extreme examples actually like kind of help bring a story home. Like, wow, that's a, that is a visual I have now imagining bears running around this New Hampshire town. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, I don't remember what the name of the town is, but if you go and like Google New Hampshire town, libertarian, overrun by bears, something like that. I'm sure you can find it. Yeah, I, I imagine. And and so you said something about like a like an annual town meeting. Is I that's a New England thing, isn't it? Like to have like like town hall meetings. Or I remember hearing about that a while ago. Uh, yeah, I mean, I had never really heard about it before moving to New England, but they have them in Maine for towns under a certain size, and they do have them in Massachusetts for towns. And yeah, it's essentially everybody who comes to the town meeting, if you live in the town and you're like a registered voter, you come to the town meeting and you're allowed to vote on whatever policies were proposed. And I know there's like limitations that you can't change certain things about the budget with your town meeting proposals, but a lot of it's very like democratic, like whoever lives in the town controls what happens and it's, it's sort of like self-governance thing. So it's really interesting and I hadn't really 
heard of it. Um, and I, I didn't get to participate in the one this year because we were out of town. But um, yeah, I, I hope to participate in the future. And uh, it seems like a really interesting process in the way that they do it. Yeah, I mean, I will say my knowledge of that kind of comes from Gilmore Girls because that was a big plot point in there or like or just like something that would happen a lot is they they lived in a New England town and they'd have like town hall meetings every so often throughout the show. It was always kind of entertaining to watch. Um, but yeah, I wanted to ask about the uh, kind of, I guess you were, you were part of the main like Democratic Party and like what is what does that look like to be kind of control like this figuring out the, the party line of us at a state level? Uh, it's still, is very much uh, a difficult process in and of itself to change things at the state level because we had sort of, you know, a group of progressive candidates who were elected to the, the state committee and, um, we had like a list of things that we wanted to see added to the platform and that sort of thing. But even within the party, there's a lot of disagreement and you have to have a lot of people to agree on these sort of things. Um, and something that I didn't think would be as much of a problem was just the, the conservative um, old guard of the Democratic Party essentially in Maine. Um, who were still pretty conservative, um, socially, fiscally, that sort of thing, but they just weren't Republicans for whatever reason, uh, who still have like really big presence in the party. Um, and so even just getting support for things like the Black Lives Matter movement, there's a lot of resistance to that in the party, which I found surprising. Um, so it's definitely a, a difficult process and it can be really frustrating. Um, but, you know, just being there and knowing that you have a voice and that you do have a chance to make a difference was was great. Um, I didn't have that much time to get involved. I was only in the party for about a year before I moved to Massachusetts um, and had to leave. But um, we, we did have a, a good thing going. And, um, I would have liked to hang around and see what happens. And I'm sure great things will happen with the main Democratic Party in the future. Yeah, I mean, well, there's no shortage of opportunities for you to get involved in <laughs> going forward. But mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sure you still have your contacts and you can, you're following it and everything. Um, yeah, definitely. With like actually running for office, what is, what is that like? Like what is, what was kind of surprising for you when like, or something you didn't anticipate that you had to do when you started running for office? Uh, so even for, like a small city council race, there's a lot involved. Um, you know, typically in Bangor, at least, city council candidates would raise like a thousand or a couple thousand dollars, something along those lines. Like the successful candidates, this is what they would do. And they would have like, you know, a voter list, like you'd see on like a national campaign, like a voter access network list of Democratic voters. And even though the the city council race itself was nonpartisan. Um, like the candidates don't have their party listed on the ballot. Um, the political parties themselves were still very much involved and, you know, candidates would still use like Republican resources or Democratic Party resources for the city council race. And the time that I ran for city council, I wasn't involved in the parties and I had tried to run as an independent. And it was, it was much more difficult than I thought it would be, um, especially not growing up there. A lot of candidates have an advantage if they grew up in the town, live there their whole life. Everybody knows their name, even if they don't know their positions or uh, what they want to do, they might still just vote for them on name recognition alone. So um, there's, there's a lot to consider even when running for, for a small race like that. I could see that happening, just like the mm -hmm. name recognition without doing the research. I, uh, something I liked about being in California was like for our elections, we have, we're given these 
like packets of information about like the candidates. And I, I don't remember that ever being a thing in Georgia, unless maybe they just never had my right address or something. And like, I grew up in Georgia and that's where I did most of my voting until I moved to California. And, and I always, I thought that was at least like a really helpful starting point for me just like to know, okay, who, this is who's running. And, and I was paying a lot more attention, like after like seeing that and like being able to like, and noticing around town, like the names of people who were running and like, I, I guess, I, I don't know, did, 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 is there something like that? Like, is there something like that in Georgia or is there any, been anything like that where you've lived? No, um, nowhere that I've lived really, but that's, that's the state that sends you that, right? In California? Yeah, it's the state, like I get a state mm -hmm. one and then I get like a local area one, like I get two like packets. Mm -hmm. I get the yeah, I know in Maine, there's like independent groups that'll do sort of a similar thing, like in Portland, Maine, in the city council races there, like uh, Portland DSA, the Democratic Socialists are sort of a, a big group and they do like a city council questionnaire and then print that out and distribute it. Um, but, you know, it doesn't go out to like every single one of the households or anything like that. It's not run by the city. And I've never lived somewhere that's done that. So that's, that's something cool that I think they do. I think they do that like in some other places like the Pacific Northwest, like either Oregon or Washington as well. Yeah, I think I maybe have seen or heard that. But yeah, I really appreciated that when I moved here. I was like, that, that's really handy because <laughs> sometimes you just, I don't know, even though like there's the internet and it's easy to find information, sometimes it's just like so much information that you don't know where to start. And so having something like that, I, I appreciated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the local papers will do it too, obviously, um, like interviewing candidates and doing mm -hmm. profiles. but um yeah getting something actually sent out to all the voters i think is really valuable because people aren't always going to look in the local paper and that sort of thing I, I would always have people come up to me like at the polls when i'm like greeting people like shaking hands being like hey this is who i am um they're like oh i didn't know you're running like who are you and they're like about to head into the polls and um like you can't reach everybody um there's a lot of like door knocking involved as a candidate. Like you can spend like eight hours a week like going and knocking on doors. And then even then you might only knock on like a few hundred to a thousand doors during your entire campaign. Um, and when you're, you know, even running in a city like Bangor, that's like probably 8,000 people voting in an election. Um, you really have to target who you're talking to and it can be hard to like get, get out that information without having like that sort of resource, like mailing it to everybody in the, the entire city. Yeah. Wow. And yeah, knocking on doors. That, and uh, so what do you hope to get when you're like at the polls and, and greeting people? Like why, why, why do that? Um, so God, I don't know. <laughs> is, is the short like... <laughs> answer but um so like in Maine there's um laws that you can't campaign within a certain distance of polling locations so when we would greet people at the polls in Bangor you're not allowed to say like if you're running for office what you're running for you're just allowed to shake hands and like say like oh yeah my name's Seth Braun and then like if somebody's asking you like why are you greeting me like are you running for something you can't answer them so I don't know how much good it does or that sort of thing, but um, you know, I didn't, I didn't really even have people like come up and ask me questions or anything. Um, but I think psychologically, like you know, people think maybe it's helpful. Like if I if I just make this connection, and then there's like it's a vote difference of one person. And it's just like somebody who voted for yeah. me because I shook their hand at the door. <laughs> maybe that makes a difference. Yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Um, Got it. Cool. Well, yeah, this has been super interesting. Like I had no idea about a lot of the like stuff. And so it's good to talk to you about that. Um, wanted to talk about kind of like life in general and what a day in the life is like for you and how has it changed since the pandemic? And I know you've moved too, so it's a lot of changes, but <laughs> just in general. Yeah. Um, it's, it's been hard in the pandemic, especially during the winter. Um, you know, we can't really get out and do stuff as much, um, but uh, 
lately we've been trying to get out and ride bikes as much as possible uh, this summer. So um, unfortunately we had like a really rainy July and we broke like some rain records in Massachusetts this year, for the rainiest July since they've been keeping records. Um, but yeah, I've, I've been reading a lot during the pandemic. So there's been a lot of that going on. Um, and really just trying to like break the cabin fever, like go on walks around the neighborhood and that sort of thing. Um, we did adopt our, our new cat muffin back in February. So we always had the cats to play with. Um, but yeah, I've been trying to keep my, myself occupied um, as much as possible, whether that's like reading books or um, I actually did pick up trying to learn languages during the pandemic. And I've, I've stayed with that for over a year now. Um, I taught myself French to like a decent level um, and I've been trying to learn Japanese. So, uh, you know, definitely staying busy and try, trying to stay stimulated has been hard, but I think I've, yeah. I've done a good job of it. What have you been using to learn your languages? Uh, so I did start off, you know, just like basically like Duolingo, that sort of thing. But, um, you know, there's a lot of like online communities, of like people who, are trying to learn languages and figure out like what's like the most effective ways and that sort of thing. And I think people can get bogged down in the details, but um, you know, I, I think Duolingo was good for like getting me started and like getting the habit going, but I've been trying to find like different podcasts to listen to because um, there are a lot of podcasts which are like geared towards like teaching you languages. And it's amazing now that we have like all these free resources, whether it's through like, um, podcasts or YouTube of like just free videos and podcasts of people teaching you a language is just like something we've had to like pay for in the past. Um, so I've watched a lot of like YouTube videos, podcasts, um, shows on Netflix. There's like tons of like French shows you can watch or like um, any language and they'll actually have like the foreign language subtitles rather than just like English subtitles. So you can use that to like improve your reading and listening skills and that sort of thing. Um, and I did actually uh, get, a, get some French books from Quebec and have been doing a lot of reading. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of things, whether it's like reading grammar books. I, I think the key thing is just to do a little bit of it every day, no matter yeah. what. Um, Consistency is key for sure. Yeah. I have I've been sort of on and off been trying to teach myself Serbian because my husband is Serbian and my in-laws don't speak English super well and mm. um, or my parents-in-law my, my brother and sister-in-law they're like really great at English but um, they still you know they well, like when they're together they'd rather speak Serbian than try to speak English to me and I understand that but mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah it's like it's hard it's so different um, and I, I kind of like get busy and then I like stop and I've been used they don't have it on Duolingo. They have a Ling mm -hmm. Ling app, but um, yeah, I keep meaning to get back to it. But it is nice, like I can hear, and I'm like learning more just by like listening to the things. Like I'll hear him on the phone or whatever, and slowly learning some things. But still, not great. Need to, you know, work on that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure it. It's good to have like a motivation, like something that you're working towards. Like trying to talk to your in-laws. Like yeah. the whole reason I started learning French is because being in New England, I'm really close to Quebec. Mm -hmm. So I've been there a few times to like Montreal and Quebec City and I just really want to, you know, like engage with the people that live there and like yeah. um, be able to read like books from Quebec and the original French and that sort of thing. Yeah, I think that's helpful. I remember at one point trying to learn Japanese too, like I, I but I kind of only learned as much as like a, a few travel phrases. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, a whole like other alphabet you have to learn, several. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, that's that's something I learned too is that it it's so much harder with some languages that are more different from English like French you know I could start reading like basic novels and stuff in French within like six months or something um, but with Japanese you know I've been learning for like a year and a half and it feels like I'm still just like reading at like a a toddler level mm -hmm. and um like you said, like the alphabet's like a huge barrier. You have to yeah. know like 2000 different kanji right. um, <laughs> to read. And so it's, it's definitely difficult. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there's like hiragana and katakana. And like, <laughs> but I mean, this mm -hmm. is the kanji that's like super hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, um, in Serbian, in Serbia, they, they use the Cyrillic alphabet, but if you go to Croatia, they use, um, they, they speak pretty much the same language. They use like the Latin alphabet, but yeah, I have my, my, my nephews, like he's five. I've, I've got his like learn to read books, <laughs> which is really helpful. <laughs> The little like kid books I, that's what I, that's the level I'm at <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah well um yeah so the kind of other area I wanted to catch up about is is you got married how did you and your wife meet uh so we met I mean we met through tender in, in Bangor <laughs> um so we went on a date at a local like uh Chinese place um and, and that was pretty much how we met. It was just through that. We didn't have any sort of connection before then. Um, but yeah, we've been together for a little over uh, three years now. And um, we got married back in, I think it was February. Um, and I only say, like, I'm not sure because we haven't actually had, like, our wedding with our family and stuff because it's been during the pandemic and we put it off till next June. Um, but we did decide to go ahead and get married on on paper back in the winter. Yeah, I did the same thing. I had a Zoom wedding, and then and then had like a more in person wedding a little a few months later. <laughs> it's definitely interesting <laughs> mm -hmm. doing that pandemic pandemic wedding. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Do you so know where you, do you want to do your wedding? Yep, we're gonna do it up in. Maine. That's where my wife's family lives still. Um, and you know, we booked the venue back when we were still living in Maine. Oh, okay. And uh yeah, we found a really great place for it up just like north of Bangor a little bit. Nice. And uh yeah, so it'll it'll be good to actually have like our family there and like do the the whole ceremony and that sort of thing mm -hmm. rather than just reading some vows and signing some papers over Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> with the like courthouse person on there yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah cool well you said I, I I remember that you always like really enjoyed reading and you said you've been reading a lot so like any good books lately yeah actually um yeah I've been reading a lot and I just started reading this book of short stories it's a collection um the complete short stories by Clarice Lispector um and it's really great so far. I'm, I'm like 100 pages into it or something. And it's all the short stories she ever wrote her entire life. She's this Brazilian, uh, I think she was a fashion journalist. And um, in the introduction to the, the short story collection, they say it's really notable because she wrote stories her entire life, essentially. And the short stories go from like when she was a young woman in her 20s all the way up until she was uh, elderly and, and dying like in, in the 2000s or something um, and she she writes in sort of like a surreal style like a lot of like Latin American um, South American authors like uh, you know like Juarez and uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez and so she's got like a very magical style. And so I, I, I think it's a really interesting collection um, and it's cool that uh, it's sort of a first and like a, a first collection of uh, short stories by like a female author throughout her entire life. So getting to see that progression from when she was younger to when she was older. Yeah, that is cool. Like I, I've liked that with some authors I read like just over the years, seeing how their writing style evolves. So that's really cool to see this, like such a wide time span. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, that's cool. Thanks for the recommendation. I'll have to look it up. Um, but yeah, that's all I had for today, Seth. Thank you so much for joining and um, lot, learned a lot. And it was great having you. Yeah, it was good to talk to you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss a single show. Interested in being on the show? know someone that might be a good fit, use the nomination form in the description.